late in New York. And uh, Dr. Abramson, are you still in New York? I am still in New York. Yes. I, maybe I'll have my my son will be in New York on uh, tomorrow night, so I'll have him come by and say hello when he's visiting our our cousin in Borough Park. Uh, just tell him to wander around, ask for me. I'm sure I'll, I'll find he'll find me. Exactly. Does anyone know where Henry is? <laughs> you know that famous joke about uh, George W. Bush. Um, wants to find out how it was an old joke I remember with George W that uh, I'll tell you later <laughs> sorry but it relates to what you're saying so um, so indeed I think that uh, what dr. Abramson doc, has already uh, has already shown is we are lucky to have a scholar with us who combines wisdom and humor and insight a, uh, a so this is a fourth of the five part series. And I've often quoted many pieces that he has said in my own teachings. And so the one thing I'm going to really encourage everyone to do is to turn on your video cameras and keep yourself on mute. So that way we don't hear the, uh, the people in the background screaming, hey, honey, did you do the dishes? But we will see you and you will be part of the community, which is what we absolutely love um, is to, uh, is to make everyone part of the community. Now, I made a plug at the six o'clock minion tonight saying that I was running home to eat dinner quickly because I shouldn't really be eating dinner while you're talking. But if someone else was at minion and wants to eat with us, please, Vivaka Shah, we'd love to see you. Um, so please feel free to turn on your cameras so that we can all be part of the, the, uh, the event tonight. And Dr. Abramson, I'd like to pass the, the mouse over to you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I appreciate it. I can't help but tell you this joke now that you reminded me of since you say your son's coming to Borough Park. So the joke goes that um, it's an old joke. It goes way back to the 90s where George W. Bush is talking with Colin Powell. He says, yeah, I just don't know what to do about Iraq. And I got to find those weapons of mass destruction. I don't know. How am I going to locate these things? If only I could talk to the Jews about this because the Jews, they seem to always know these things like that raid on Entebbe, and they just seem to have tremendous insight into, uh, you know, the world of spycraft and things like that. So Colin Powell says to him, well, Mr. President, we could probably insert you into one of those neighborhoods, but you'd have to go deep undercover because we can't just have you wandering around, uh, you know. Brooklyn uh, to speak to Jews. So he said, let's do it. So the joke goes that they dress him up with a capota and they put a, you know, a flat pizza hat on him with the fake payas and a beard and things like that. And with a black helicopter, they insert the president into the middle of uh, Borough Park. Oh, and they told him that he has to use a code word to introduce himself. Uh, he shouldn't just walk up to people and start speaking English because, you know, uh, the he would give himself away right away. And uh, if he really wants to find out how the Jews know all of these things in advance, he has to, like, use the code word. What's the code word? He has to say, Shalom Aleichem, right? That when he meets a, a Jew in the street, he should go up and say, Shalom Aleichem. So they do it. They dress them all up, the kapata, the tzitzis on the outside, the whole thing. Black helicopter drops into the middle of Borough Park, 13th Avenue, and he's walking around. He sees a few Hasidim standing in the street, and he goes up to them, and he says, ah, excuse me, shalom aleichem. And they turn to him and say, welcome to Borough Park, Mr. President. We've been expecting you. <laughs> That's the joke. Okay, so let me uh, switch to something that I actually should be talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about the, um, the fourth of the five lectures tonight on the, uh, the history of the Jews, all of Jewish history, skipping over the boring parts. So my task for today in the next 55 odd minutes is to basically cover 400 years. I'm hoping to go from the Spanish Inquisition right up until the turn of the 20th century. And then uh, when we meet, uh, God willing, in June, then we'll be able to focus on the 20th century and have a few moments to talk about the last couple of decades, which have been quite momentous as well. So that's the plan for today. Um, can everyone see my screen? Actually, I, I just lost the little, there we go. Everyone can see the, uh, the screen with the young boy preparing for bar mitzvah, I hope. Someone nod. 
Ms. Moss, I can see her. Oh, good. I see a hands up there. Thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay, so let us begin by looking at Spain first. Now, one of the, um, the uh, misconceptions about Spain that's extremely common is the notion that the Inquisition was directed against Jews. Technically speaking, it was not. It was directed primarily against Christians of Jewish background. And I'll explain uh, the, the, the reasoning behind this. Uh, in order to understand the Inquisition, which begins formally in 1478 in Spain, it, you have to go back 100 years earlier to 1391, when there is a wave of anti-Jewish violence that sweeps across the peninsula and uh, is accompanied by a lot of um, forced baptisms. And these Jews are coming out of their synagogues in, you know, uh, Barcelona or in Sevilla and places like that. And they're accosted by a mob that takes out some holy water and pronounces them baptized, often by lay clergy who are themselves quite illiterate. And they find themselves suddenly converted to Christianity. Now, this is actually forbidden by church law, uh, and it has been forbidden for quite a bit longer than the uh, the Inquisition, but the church had a rather ambiguous position in that if a Jew were to be so baptized, uh, even though it was contrary to church dictates to do so under duress, nevertheless, the baptism was considered uh, effective, and the Jew was now a Christian. And so what that meant was, all of a sudden, in Spain, you had a very large number, perhaps 60 to 75,000 Jews, who now were, you know, had no intention of belonging to the Christian community, of leaving their Jewish background, but they had all the rights and privileges of Christians. Uh, they were no longer subject to residency restrictions. They could pursue higher education. They could pursue any activity, economic, cultural, otherwise, that was open to Christians. And over the course of the next century, Jews just flourished in Spain, especially those so-called conversos or uh, converts to Christianity, who were still going back to the Jewish neighborhoods, were still sending their children to Cheder and buying at the local kosher butcher, but they were living otherwise, you know, emancipated lives. And, and they were really, you know, occupying higher and higher uh, echelons in Spanish society. In fact, one of the great debates within the historiography of the Spanish Inquisition is, uh, was it a reaction to uh, religious impetus that they were really upset that there were Jews who were not taking their new Christian status seriously? Or was it really an economic type of struggle in which you had this strange population that was not taking Christianity seriously who were beginning to occupy high levels of Spanish society? Be that as it may, in the 1470s, uh, the, uh, the Spanish crown, motivated by the nobility, decided to do something about it, and they uh, initiated the Inquisition at the behest of the church, which especially looked at Jews who were failing to observe Christian rituals after they had been baptized. And of course, this is now affecting generations of Jews, because we're talking about 1391, the first forced um, baptisms, all the way up to 1478. So, it created this bizarre kind of environment in which uh, people would report to the church authorities that they they um, they uh, they smelled uh, the calzone at their neighbor's house being cooked, and their neighbor did not put pork in it. And so the the Inquisition police would actually show up. You know, you can never expect the Spanish Inquisition. They would show up, they would arrest them, they would torture them horribly, they would demand a forced confession out of them to name all of their other friends who were also doing similar things, and it just spiraled out of control. It was especially difficult to keep under wraps because the church created a system in which if a Jew was so convicted of Judaizing, meaning a, this is actually a Christian, a new Christian as they called them, uh, was actually convicted of, of practicing Judaism, uh, their property could be confiscated, 
uh, a sec um, an amount of it would go to the church, another amount would go to the crown, and another amount, another part of the bounty would actually go to the person who informed on them. So there was like a built-in incentive to perpetuate the Inquisition. Uh, it, it just got way out of hand. Uh, here are three pictures of uh, uh, Christians, you know, new Christians, Jews who had been converted forcibly, who were forced under various regulations to admit their um, their uh, the error of their ways. In some cases, they were forced to wear this humiliating tunic called the San Benito for the rest of their lives. Uh, and then after death, the San Benitos were hung up in the churches as a kind of a public display and humiliation of the family. And in the worst cases, they would uh, be um, sent to the church the term used was, I'm sorry, uh, sent by the church to secular authorities. The term they used was relaxed. They would be relaxed to the secular authorities who would then place them on trial and have them burned at the stake. In these horrific things called autos da fe, here you can see the Jews at the center stage in this particular uh, auto da fe, of which there were thousands of them. Uh, an estimated 300,000 Jews lost their lives this way over the course of about six centuries, not quite six. Uh, let's see, the Inquisition ended in the 1880s. So we're talking about 400 years of, uh, of Inquisitions and autof da fe's went all the way up until the 1700s in the New World. Horrible uh, uh, types of events. In some cases, one that I'm researching right now, uh, if the... Uh, uh, if the uh, new Christian actually died before they could burn him, uh, they would even burn his remains. They would actually, there was one individual, a Jew who became a doctor and fled to India. Uh, they brought his bones back to Spain and they burned him at the stake, his bones at the stake in Spain. It was an absolutely insane, crazy, brutal period of time. Um, and what ended up happening is that it didn't work. You know, they imposed this uh, horrific kind of purge-like atmosphere that completely assumed the society. And at a certain point, they said, you know, we're, we're, we're just not getting rid of, of the Jewish influence. It's just getting bigger and bigger because, of course, there was an incentive to keep getting it bigger and bigger. So finally, the Grand Inquisitor, who was shown in this remarkable portrait by Emilio Sala, he's in the black in the center there, uh, Thomas de Torquemada, he said to the king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella, shown uh, behind them, uh, that the, the real reason why the uh, baptisms are not taking effect is because the, uh, the regular Jews who were not subject to the Inquisition because they were never uh, determined to be Christians through false baptism, they continued to influence the later generations of new Christians. By the way, the... Uh, derogatory term for these converts uh, was maranos, which means literally pigs or swine. So that's usually not the term used by scholarship today. Um, they're sometimes referred to as new Christians, conversos, or crypto Jews because they were hiding their Jewish practices. In this particular dramatic scene, Torquemada explains to the king and queen and the nobility that the only way to solve the Jewish problem is to expel all of the Jews, and then the new Christians will slowly adapt to Christianity. The figure with his back to us in the majestic red cloak is Isaac Abravanel, or Abarbanel, a brilliant commentator on the Bible who lived at that time and made a last-minute plea for mercy. It was rejected, uh, and it was especially bitter because Abarbanel had actually been involved in even setting up the king and queen for their own marriage. Uh, the king and queen, because they valued him, he was a minister in government, he was the number two uh, minister of finance, they, they begged him to remain. If only he would convert, they would give him tremendous wealth, but he refused, and he set sail with all of the other expellees in 1492. His boss, the number one uh, minister of finance, who was also Jewish, Rabbi Abraham Senor, chose instead to convert, and he became incredibly wealthy, but uh, his family was completely lost to Judaism. So essentially, that's what happened. The Inquisition sort of like grinds to an inevitable conclusion that the only way to deal with the Jewish problem in Spain is to expel the Jews proper, and they are sent throughout the Mediterranean basin. This was like 
a horrific cataclysmic event for Jews in the 15th century. It would be something comparable to if, God forbid, all of a sudden all the Jews were to be expelled from New York. It was Spain was incredibly important, huge, old, very successful Jewish community suddenly being scattered to the winds. Uh, and it was absolutely horrific and for the entire Jewish world. This map shows you some of the uh, routes that they took across uh, the Mediterranean into North Africa. Uh, they were actually very warmly welcomed, as we shall see in a moment, by the Muslims based in Constantinople. The Sultan actually laughed at the King and Queen of Spain saying, why are you giving up? such incredibly valuable human resources. We will take all the Jews that you expel because we know that they will contribute to the wealth and the prosperity of our country. Uh, many went simply across land borders into Portugal, where five years later they would also be expelled, although it was a rather different kind of expulsion because they were exposed to a, another forced baptism, uh, and you had a much bigger crypto-Jewish problem there as a result. Others crossed the Pyrenees into Europe to safe havens like Amsterdam, and a few, as you can see on the left, went a las Americas, made their way all the way over to the New World, where they actually constituted, for example, the, the base population of Recife, uh, a, uh, an island controlled by Portugal, and later made their way up to establish the community in New York. Uh, no Jews at this particular time went to Canada, but that's only because they had not figured out universal health care. Uh, afterwards, once they realized that it really made so much sense, they would have gone up north, but this is a little too early. Uh, fascinating kind of intellectual uh, changes resulted primarily from the Portuguese diaspora. And you may have heard that the term Spanish and Portuguese are often used as a kind of a duality, like there's a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue here in New York, uh, and there are many other synagogues around the world that have that same you know, sort of uh, nomenclature. And the reason for this is because there was a key distinction. The Spanish Jews were generally those who were never baptized and who were forced to flee the peninsula. Portuguese Jews, on the other hand, typically had been forcibly baptized. They had like the Christian driver's license that allowed them into any kind of institution they wanted. And they became extremely successful uh, in uh, international uh, trade because they were not subject to anti-Jewish legislation, but they frequently readopted their Jewish identities once they were, once they felt sometimes falsely that they were safe from the reaches of the Inquisition. But it created a phenomenal intellectual turmoil, like in this particular individual shown here, um, uh, an individual named Uriel da Costa, who, like many Portuguese Jews, um, only learned that he was, in fact, Jewish when he was a teenager. Uh, parents of crypto-Jews, you know, they would keep it a secret because they wouldn't want their children to go playing with other children and then, you know, blab that they were their mother lit candles on Friday night or something like that. So he only found out when he was already a teenager. He was quite an intellectual individual. He actually went on to study theology at the University of Coimbra. Very successful, brilliant individual. Uh, and his mother told him, you know what? Uh, we've finally got an opportunity to leave Portugal, and I want to let you know that when we leave, we're actually Jewish, and we're going to adopt our Jewish identity. He was thrilled. He was, you know, excited beyond words that he was actually going to join this ancient biblical people that he read about so long. Uh, the problem was that because all Jewish materials, all Jewish teachers, all Jewish books were forbidden under the Portuguese Inquisition, he had really no idea what Jews were really like. He thought that they were like, you know, Abraham and Moses, and they were like, you know, superhuman figures. So when they finally got to Amsterdam, he was like incredibly enthusiastic, and, and he was a big baltruva, as it were. He was like flipped out, to use the terminology that the young people use. Um, but he was really upset that Amsterdam Jews were like regular people and they tended to talk about business on Shabbat and they engaged in a certain amount of Lush and Hara and occasionally they were involved in slightly criminal activity and he was like what is this you're all Jews how can you behave like this and he got into more and more trouble 
he was uh he he probably had you know it's, it's hard to diagnose 400 years later but uh, he probably had some kind of deep mental illness what ended up happening was he actually published a book criticizing the jews from within uh well-meaning but you know definitely landed like a lead balloon and um the he was excommunicated three times from the local community each time he begged forgiveness to be allowed back and they eventually said okay listen but uriel you got to stop this crazy self-criticism you know we're we're we don't want to look bad in front of the non-Jews among whom we live. Just keep your criticism, you know, quiet. At the third reacceptance, the Beit Din in Amsterdam said to him, Uriel, this time, you know, is already too much. We will accept you back, but we're going to require you to recite a public confession in the synagogue. That's what's shown here in Maurice Gottlieb's work. Uh, you will be flogged. Uh, and this was a symbolic flogging with like a shoelace, not like with leather whips for pain, but it was meant to be humiliating. And then you're supposed to lie down on the front steps of the synagogue as the entire synagogue membership walks over your prone form on their way home. Deeply humiliating uh, experience. He went through it nevertheless. Then he went home. He wrote a 12-page suicide note called the example of a human life and then he killed himself with a revolver or with a pistol terrifying terrifying story that illustrates the the kind of intellectual break that occurred with the inquisition and the release of all these jews who had experienced full civil rights without having any connection to their jewish identity and history and being unable to tether them once again to a sense of reality. Another very famous example, also from the Portuguese uh, diaspora, although in many ways much more stable, uh, Baruch Spinoza, who is in some ways Uriel da Costa's intellectual heir. I love this particular image because it says at the bottom, Benedictus de Spinoza, Judeus et atheista, right? He's Jewish and an atheist. Of course, those two things go together. So this is a kind of like deep seated psychological distress that was caused by the Spanish Inquisition and expulsion. Uh, let's have a look at uh, one particular aspect of the diaspora that will lead us into the Eastern European center in particular. I hope some of you may recognize this famous cemetery. It is, of course, the, uh, the great Kabbalistic cemetery in the city of Tzfat in northern Israel, which in the uh, immediate post-expulsion environment, saw a remarkable explosion of Jewish creativity that lasted for about half a century. It was truly, uh, you know, uh, it's impossible to describe how in this tiny town, which really doesn't have much history, uh, it suddenly became the magnet for so many brilliant minds, including Rabbi Yosef Karo, who was the author of the Shulchan Aruch, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz, the author of the Lecha Dodi poem that we sing on Friday nights, the, um, his son-in-law, the great Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who was one of the great synthesizers of Kabbalah, the al Sheikh, a tremendous biblical commentary, commentator, and perhaps most famous, uh, the great Arizal, the um, uh, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who came specifically from Egypt to study with Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, and they studied for nine months together before the, the, er, the, the former passed away. Uh, and Tzfat, the reason why it attracted so many of these expellees is because they felt completely displaced all over. They felt that there has to be something that was going to replace the gravitational center of Spain. And they, many of them felt that, in fact, this was the messianic era unfolding. Uh, the images that you see here are some of the products of these early diaspora refugees. On the right is the famous Ferrara Bible, published by Jews in Spanish, a very early Spanish translation of the Bible. On the left, a remarkable work of early historiography uh, in Portuguese, The Consolation for the Tribulation of Israel, which is the history of Jews for all time written in a kind of uh, a poetic trialogue between 
uh, three prophets looking at the the history of the Jews. Really remarkable work. Look at the artwork as well. And the, on both of these books, they they have images of uh, of um, of navigation, of being out and finding new places. Especially in the Ferrara Bible, you can see there's like a, a boat at sea in distress with its mast broken, and it's surrounded by sea monsters. And this is kind of like the environment that the Jews are working in in the 1500s. Uh, there were some tremendous leaders who tried to capitalize on the uh, the the, uh, the distress to uh, to benefit the Jews. Uh, two of them, ironically, were women women of phenomenal power, great titans who unfortunately did not see to eye to eye on some very crucial things. Uh, one of them is Doña Gracia Mendes Nasi. This is believed to be an actual portrait of her by the immortal painter Bronzini, a really a, a luminous portrait. Uh, and um, one of the crises that occurred that involved this great philanthropist who um, was who joined the, uh, the Portuguese diaspora. She was uh, converted to Christianity. And then when she got out of Portugal, she uh, uh, reasserted her Jewish identity, uh, occurred in the Italian city of Ancona, where uh, there was a community of Portuguese Jews living. Again, recall that they are technically Christians, but once they're far away from the church, they figure they can get away with living as Jews again. And uh, they had lived there for several decades without incident until there was a change in the papacy. And the new pope could not uh, believe that there were actually um, Christians who were practicing Judaism in the Italian peninsula, and he burned 25 of them at the stake. This was considered such an incredible, you know, affront to the status quo, where basically they were just, you know, dealing with uh, mercantile activities in the port of Ancona. So Doña Gracia said, that's it. Jews are living all over the Mediterranean basin. I propose we launch an international boycott against the Pope until he agrees to drop the Inquisition. Hugely audacious move that attracted the support of the Sultan in Constantinople, who said, great idea, I'd love to see the church weakened as well. And he ma she managed to gather a large coalition of Jews in finance and industry, and especially in trade, to join and say, we're not going to, to ship anything to ports controlled by the church. Unfortunately, her plan could not come to pass because uh, she had a tremendous opponent, uh, a woman named Benvenida Abravanel, who was also a tremendous supporter of Jewish causes. Uh, she was one of the people who paid for the publication of the Ferrara Bible and others. Uh, and she was among the Spanish diaspora, right? The famous Abravano family. She was a niece to Don Isaac, who we, we saw earlier. And uh, she said, no, we can't do that because we have so many Jews living in church lands. If we are to antagonize the Pope, he may take it out on those Jews. And so she uh, opposed the boycott that Doña Gracia had proposed. And ultimately, between these two very powerful, wealthy women, the, the plan ended up not succeeding. Um, there's a lot more to say about both of these women in particular, but I just wanted to highlight the unusual role that women played in the 15th century in particular because of the great upheaval and the change in status of so many families it became possible for talented women especially women of means to assert themselves in leadership roles which had never been the case before incidentally uh, this is also a bronzini the same artist who painted the uh, the other one of doña gracia unfortunately this is not a portrait of uh Benvenida Abravanel. I wish it were. It's actually a portrait of her student uh, because uh, Benvenida was uh, such a, a cultured woman that the, uh, the uh, royal family asked her to teach etiquette to a, their young daughter. Uh, and they, they felt that, uh, you know, learning from an older Jewish woman would be the best way for their daughter to learn proper manners. And if you think it is really inappropriate for me to show a picture of a student rather than of the teacher, I have to say, it, it, you know, it happens to me often where often, you know, my students will use pictures of my students and they'll say, it's actually me. 
and there is a striking resemblance you know it's really hard to get away from it thank you for it, tolerating my humor okay so why did these jews end up in spot to return to our story uh you can see in this particular map here, this is the extent of the Ottoman Empire at its uh, greatest expansion, centered in Constantinople, which is, uh, let's see if I put my mouse here, you might be able to see it. Here's Constantinople right here on the Bosporus, a very important strait that connects the Black Sea into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and uh, Sfat is here in the north of Israel. They had just taken over this region in the 1500s, and the Sultan uh, opened up the region to Jewish travelers and traders in textiles in particular. So you combine this sudden opening of a new trade route with very beneficial tax laws, and you have this massive expulsion of Jews from the, the peninsula, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and they many of them were drawn specifically to Tzfat. There was also a kind of a spiritual tourism going on there because the graves of many uh, Talmudic figures are buried in that region. It's near Meron, for example, where Lagba Omer is typically celebrated. We're almost up to Lagba Omer now. So many Jews traveled there to visit the graves of the righteous and things like that. And what especially was associated with this region was the explosion of Kabbalah. Uh, it was, you know, a, such a, a perhaps the, the greatest uh, period of creativity in Kabbalistic thought since the ancient period, since the, the 13th century with the Zohar. This was a period of phenomenal creativity, uh, which we still, you know, we feel the reverberations even today with, uh, for example, the Hasidic movement. Uh, in very brief terms, what's going on here? The, 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 the primary driving energy in uh, the Kabbalistic world of Tzfat at this time was the fact that the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, himself the child of Portuguese refugees, um, he was the first thinker to actually systematize the rather haphazard, crazy, diverse texts that comprise the Kabbalistic canon. He wrote a book called Pardes Rimonim, The Orchard of Pomegranates, which was, you know, just a, compared to everything else, a really straightforward guide to how God created the world and how God maintains the world even today. It's expressed in particular with this particular diagram called the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life, which um, essentially is kind of like a refraction of light through a series of filters. Uh, the metaphor that is used in the Kabbalistic literature is like, if you can imagine that um, God wanted to create the world, but how do you create a finite world if you are an infinite being, right? If, if God is infinite, where is there room for any finitude within infinity? It, it just doesn't make sense. So they argued that God, as it were, shrunk himself. It's a process called symptom, kind of like I imagine an, an amoeba sort of opening up a, a vacuum within the, uh, the cell structure. And then God reinserted slowly a little bit of divine light uh, into that vacuum, which created the physical world in which we live. However, uh, again, reaching this philosophical divide between infinity and finitude is extremely difficult. So the metaphor they use is pouring hot oil into clay vessels. You pour the hot oil into the first clay vessel, but the, the heat of the oil is so overwhelming that the vessel shatters, and then the oil mixed with the pieces of the vessel fall down and are caught by a second vessel, which also shatters, falling into a third vessel until you get to the tenth vessel, at which point the oil is so contaminated, contaminated by the pieces of broken vessels that it has cooled down and it can actually maintain a stable state. We live in that tenth level that is a mixture of that hot oil, meaning the divine energy, and physicality that's all mixed together. Now, the Ramak posited this as kind of like God's divine plan for creating the universe, but his student, who ultimately eclipsed the teacher and fame, 
uh, and in popularity, the Arizal, he said that all of this was some kind of strange cataclysmic accident, that it was not meant to be this way. I don't really understand Kabbalah. I'm just trying to explain it as best as I understand it. But that the, this was like something that created a, a huge tear in the fabric of the universe. And the big difference between the Ramak and the, uh, the Arizal in this regard is that the Arizal's Kabbalah comes with an imperative, that it is the job of a Jew to go throughout this physical world find those sparks of holiness in every bit of materialism and then elevate those spirit those sparks so they may rejoin the um you know the cosmos and ultimately bring about the messianic era this kind of like uh urgency and imperative mood in the arizal's kabbalah is what essentially set the hasidic world on fire and they they rely very heavily on the Arizal's conception of the universe. Sorry for that slight discursus, but it'll help make sense uh, when we get to the Hasidim in about five or 10 minutes. So going back to, so you've got this amazing community in Svat that for the 1500s just explodes with creativity. Uh, it ends almost as suddenly with a combination of earthquakes and cholera plagues. So by the time you get to the 1600s, uh, Tzvat is basically a, a backwater again. So if we move up to Europe, however, this is a period when Jews begin to make their way to the East. We touched on this last time we spoke, that there were two factors. There is a, um, a, a negative factor, the growth of anti-Semitism pushing Jews out of Western Europe. And there is at the same time kind of a vacuum, uh, an economic opportunity incentive in Eastern Europe that's drawing Jews into places like the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as you can see in this particular map. So over the course of the period from the Crusades in the late 11th century up until the 16th century, you have just, you know, uh, communities, whole communities of Jews making their way east to places like Ukraine. In Ukraine, they uh, occupy a difficult position in the, um, the economy. And basically, they were, uh, this kind of pre-modern community involved whole classes of people doing the same kinds of work based on their ethnicity. Uh, it's hard to imagine that because in Canada and in America, we live in much more multicultural societies. But I don't know, I don't know what it's like in Vancouver, but for example, in New York, it is incredibly difficult to find a single dry cleaning institution that is not run by Koreans. I don't know why. I may be in Korea, they're incredibly clean. They clean their suits every day. But here, it just seems to be kind of like a ladder migration thing that every dry cleaning institution is run by Koreans. So it was like that, although multiplied 100 times. In Ukraine, you had uh, massive numbers of Ukrainian peasants, largely illiterate, working as farmers. You had the Polish nobility, who were typically far away, big landowners, and they they hired the Jews to manage their properties, to charge all kinds of taxes and fees, uh, to get the income out of this primitive economy, and then transfer it up to the Polish nobility. Uh, the This middleman position is very difficult. It had some level of symbiosis, and in fact, it, it was the norm for hundreds of years. So that allowed for a tremendous amount of cultural cross-fertilization to happen between Jews and Ukrainians, but it also was intrinsically exploitative. One example of this is the, uh, this 1928 illustration here of a Krechma, a typical Jewish inn. The Polish noblemen would typically give Jews the exclusive right to distill and sell alcohol. So if, uh, you know, peasants or as in this occasion, the Ukrainians are in their, their finery, would want to get a social drink, they would have to go to the Krechma, where the music was played by Jewish klezmer musicians, the bartender was Jewish, and you could, you could uh, buy your alcohol on a tab. But the thing is, when harvest time came, you'd have to pay up that tab and so on. Uh, and this is kind of something like a, a difficult situation where, you know, there are lots of room for abuse, which actually happened. Uh, but 
At the same time, it is a necessary service to the larger community. Nevertheless, in the 1700s, it erupts in violence, uh, led by this man, Bohdan Khmelnytsky, one of the most paradoxical and problematic figures in Ukrainian Jewish history. Uh, he is viewed uh, correctly as a horrible anti-Semite and pogromist because in his rebellion, which was principally directed against the Polish Catholic noblemen, uh, he attacked Jewish middlemen communities, which were fundamentally much closer and much more accessible than the Poles to the north. And horrible massacres of 1648-49 in particular were perpetrated by this man. At the same time, the Ukrainians look at him and they see him as their national liberator, as their George Washington. And there is like, they're completely uh, unaware of the whole history of anti-Semitism that goes along with him and his movement at the same time. But it is doubly ironic. Here you can see it's actually his face is on a, a, um, a post-Soviet Ukrainian uh, five hryvnia note. Um, you know, we've gone from Khmelnytsky to Zelensky, where ironically we have a Jewish president of this country that that actually uh, lionizes people like Khmelnytsky. I, I watch Zelensky's Telegram channel and um, it always amazes me. One of the things that he does on this telegram is he he presents medals to people who uh, you know uh, fought bravely or or ran medical stations and things like that. And one of the highest honors they can give is the Order of Bohdan Khmelnytsky. And I find it so ironic that this this five foot six Jew is giving this hulking Ukrainian Cossack a, a medal in the name of Bohdan Khmelnytsky. One of the ironies of history. At any rate, the Jews do enjoy a fairly rapid recovery after the debilitating pogroms, but right away they're enmeshed in another massive controversy, the Shabbatai Tzvi episode, in which you have this individual who comes from Smyrna, also a person like Goriel da Costa, apparently suffering from, from some kind of mental illness, you know, hard to do to do any kind of diagnosis, especially because I have no training whatsoever, but it sounds a lot like something like bipolar disorder or a manic depressive type of disorder where he would go through phases where he, which he called illuminations, where he believed that he could levitate. He believed that he had superpowers and things like that. Uh, he was a, a bright individual, but uh, somewhat of a wanderer. And he ended up meeting up with this man shown here on the left, Nathan of Gaza, who uh, who convinced him essentially that Shabbatai Tzvi, you are actually Mashiach, you are actually the long-awaited Messiah, and we have to like, you know, popularize your existence and um, and then take it to the Sultan and take back Jerusalem. Uh, this was incredibly successful all over Europe. Jews were ready for this message, so much so that it attracted a lot of attention in the non-Jewish press. This is, this is a non-Jewish woodcut that describes Nathan of Gaza leading the 10 tribes of Israel from their uh, exile back to the land of Israel. And, um, uh, you know, Shabbatai Tzvi went along with it. And uh, for a period of about eight years, he actually acquired a very large following. Finally, though, he went to the Sultan and said, here I am. I'm the, you know, the, the long-awaited Messiah. It's time for you to give Jerusalem to me so I can initiate the Messianic period. And the Sultan said to him, not directly, he didn't even want to meet with him. He sent him an, a by emissary that uh, he wasn't going to do that. Uh, and he said to him, Shabsi, do you mind if I call it Shabsi? He said, uh, I will instead offer that you can keep your head on your shoulders as long as you convert to Islam. And to the great disappointment of his followers, Shabtai Tzvi accepted that offer. He converted to Islam, and the vast majority of his followers, many of whom had sold all their possessions and their property in order to follow Shabtai Tzvi, they ended up having to go back home penniless and try to rebuild their lives. A small number of them, however, thought, wait a second, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a political movement that when things get so crazy, people actually double down and say, no, 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 QAnon is real. And uh, they said, if Shabbatai Tzvi, the Messiah, converted to Islam, then that must mean that we should convert to Islam too. 
And so uh, a significant small minority of his followers actually converted to Islam. Uh, they were known as the Dunme, and they persisted right up into the 20th century, very active in particular in Turkey and politics and so on, continuing to have their impact. But the, the combination of the, the great, um, you know, uh, Kabbalistic revival and the disappointment of the failure of the Shabbatai Tzvi movement uh, seems to have contributed to the growth of a much more lasting Jewish reform movement, <clears throat> that of the Hasidim. And here you can see Hasidim in my neck of the woods here in, uh, in Borough Park, where George Bush will be visiting later. Uh, uh, amazingly, uh, research done by my colleague, Professor Moshe Rossman uh, from Bar Ilan University, uh, was able to discover the actual tax records of the founder of Hasidism, a man named uh, El Israel Ben Eliezer, the Baal Shem Tov. This is actually one page of the tax records of his town, Medjibush. Uh, and the Baal Shem Tov preached a kind of uh, much more popular Judaism that was far less text-based was much more about the gestalt of the, the joy of, of camaraderie, of alcohol, of singing and dancing. And it proved to be an extremely popular way to think about an individual's Jew's relationship to God and to community. And it, it, it became extremely important in the region of Ukraine in particular. Uh, I would like to be able to talk about it in, in much greater detail, but we've got a lot of history to get through. Here, however, is a map from a delightful book called The Historical Atlas of Hasidism that, that shows the spread of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov through his primary disciple, the Magid of Mezerich, uh, which resulted in uh, the great Hasidic movements that are uh, extant today, including Chabad, um, which is uh, it, one of the students of the Magid was the, uh, the, the, the altar rebbe of Chabad. However, uh, the, the Hasidic movement was not without its critics, which coalesced around this institution, the Yeshiva of Volozhin, that was located uh, in Vilnius, or in Lithuania, near Vilnius, uh, led by the, uh, the famous Vilna Gaon, the great Talmudic giant. There was a series of bans uh, of excommunications placed on the Hasidim uh, for a whole host of uh, charges, some real, some imagined, but arguing that they were essentially twisting Judaism out of where it meant to be, that they were ignoring the study of the Talmud, that they were engaging in raucous behavior that was completely inappropriate. Uh, the Hasidim struck back with their own counterbands, and there was a huge controversy in which at its worst, uh, they were literally throwing each other in jail because they would report to the Tsar, hey, these new Hasidim, they actually are anti-Russian. And the Tsar would say, is that so? Well, let me arrest them and let me put them in jail. Uh, and and they the same thing happened to the opponents of the Hasidim who acquired the name uh, Mitznagdim or Misnagdim, meaning the opponents, because they opposed Hasidism. But what ended up happening that was that in the early 19th century, when they realized that they had a much greater threat coming from the West in the form of the Haskalah, they both sort of like said, hey, we've got to calm down. And uh, they eventually formed the rapprochement that persists to this day. Meanwhile, in Russia as a whole, much of the early Hasidic movement was uh, was uh, took place under Polish rule, but it transferred to Russian rule from the 1770s onward. Uh, this woman on the left, the Tsarina Catherine the Great, Catherine II, uh, she conquered Poland and suddenly found herself owning the territory with the largest single concentration of Jews in the entire world. Russia itself was um, free of Jewish population because in the year 1479, there was a scandal in which a, uh, a member of the royal household converted to Judaism under the influence of a Jewish doctor who was active in Moscow. And after that, the Tsar said no more Jews allowed in Russia at all. But when Catherine expanded the boundaries of Russia to include Ukraine and Poland and Belarus, then she suddenly had to deal with all of these Polish Jews. Uh, many of her, uh, her staffers, including the church, were saying, well, expel them as well. Send them further west. We don't want the Jews. But on the other hand, 
uh, the uh, the economics of including the Jews proved to be really quite attractive. So she created a compromise. She established this region, which has the strange English term, the pale of settlement. I don't, you know, it's it's probably derived from English history where they use that term to refer to the boundary with Scotland, but in Russian, uh, it just simply reads the region of settlement. Uh, this is an area where Jews were allowed to continue living. Uh, and although in Catherine's time, it was considered a great compromise that was for the benefit of the Jews, because they essentially were not displaced by her conquest. They couldn't enter Russia, but they couldn't enter it before either. Um, however, a hundred odd years later, it was eventually regarded as a kind of a huge ghetto where later Tsars would impose horrific anti-Semitic legislation that was extremely noxious. And uh, it was like the world's biggest ghetto by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century. Perhaps the, the most awful example of this was the attempt by Tsar Nicholas I um, to forcibly assimilate the Jews by removing their traditional exemption from military service. Uh, Jews being essentially, you know, foreigners in, in many of the countries in which they lived with a very distinct culture, distinct language, of course, a distinct religion, frequently would simply pay a much larger tax load and they were exempted from military service. This was a very common practice throughout the Middle Ages and that was the, the custom in Russia as well. Let us not forget, by the way, that joining the military in Russia in the 1800s was a career choice. The term of service was 25 years long. So typically it would only go to like third sons who had no chance of uh, joining, of gaining land from their father, uh, or they didn't want to join the church, so they would join the army. But for Jews, this was a death sentence. They were separated from the Jewish community, no kosher food, no Shabbat, nothing. So Jews always paid the tax. And what Nicholas I did is he said, you know what? The army is the best way to assimilate the Jews. So I'm going to remove that exemption and we will take Jewish boys into the army as well. And knowing full well that the... Um, by the time a Jewish boy is 18, he's already, you know, had a bar mitzvah. He's already probably married. He's already, you know, had his first egg roll. There's no way that he's going to go uh, and abandon his Jewish identity easily. So therefore, he, uh, he allowed the uh, taking of Jews from the age of 12. Uh, these were the so-called kantonisten because they were taken and put into a military school called a canton. And uh, after serving there for six years, then they would have their 25 year sentence. Uh, and this is a scene here, a 1980 painting that, uh, that depicts the, the seizure of one boy from a family, which was you know, a terrifying event. Um, and it is the reason why so many Jews uh, fled Russia because they did not want to serve in the Tsar's army. That's actually one of the reasons why uh, my Zaidi, Oliver Shalom, chose to leave Lithuania was because he certainly did not want to be conscripted to fight the, Rus the Japanese in the uh, Russo-Japanese War. Um, there was also another way out that if you did not want, uh, I think someone should just uh, adjust their mic. I think um, I to find out where that noise is coming from. Here it is. Let's try that. Uh, the, uh, the, the way to avoid conscription was to agree to put your child in an uh, official crown school run by the Russian government, which was essentially just another conversion factory, which was staffed by Orthodox Russian priests and so on. So Jews had uh, to expose their children to the risk of the army or the risk of the uh, the propaganda of the schools, and it was a, a very terrible time. You can imagine how this would contribute to their displeasure and ultimately to the revolution. Okay, wow, we're rushing along. I have four minutes left to get us through the last bit. Uh, if we have to, I'll just squeeze some of the end of this presentation onto next week's presentation, but uh, I'll end within four minutes. Here's a map that shows you the concentration of Jews around the year 750, 1750. You can see that they tend to be concentrated towards the east, but there's still some significant population in some of the larger European towns like Amsterdam, for example, Berlin, and so on. Um, the, um, 
there's a huge amount of intellectual ferment happening in Western Europe, led by a man like Moses Mendelssohn, who argued that Jews should be emancipated, they should be given equal rights without having to convert to Christianity, which was otherwise the only way that they could gain any foothold in European society. Um, this related to uh, denominationalism, as German Jews in particular, try to find ways to articulate their Jewish identity in such a way that they could gain political benefit through emancipation without totally sacrificing their Jewish identities. On the left, you see David Friedlander, who is one of the students of Moses Mendelssohn, who argued that Jews should actually undergo a kind of dry baptism, meaning like nobody really takes it seriously anyways, so we should all convert and, uh, but, you know, it'll be like the Spanish period where people will know that we're still actually Jewish. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Samson Rafael Hirsch, uh, also from Germany, who said that, no, uh, what we should do is just carefully draw the line between what is halakha, what is actually Jewish law, and what is custom. And when it's custom, then we can deal with it differently uh, in order to adapt ourselves to German norms. In the middle, you have Zacharias Frankel, who is associated in particular with the conservative movement. Basically, the reform movement, I haven't shown you, uh, but a man named Abraham Geiger is especially associated with that. The reform movement says essentially we should reform Judaism to make it more acceptable to the societies in which we live, which entailed a lot of major changes. Um, the the neo-Orthodox under Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch said, uh, no, you've got to stick to the tried and true Bible-thumping Judaism, but around the edges, maybe we can do something. Zacharias Frankel tried to find a midpoint where he essentially agreed with the idea of reform, but disagreed heavily with the pace of reform, uh, which he felt was just rushing headlong into assimilation. He particularly objected to the abandonment of Hebrew in the scripture and, and the, um, the liturgy. And that's when he said, you know, we've got to create something different. He created something called historical positivist Judaism, which would ultimately um, result in the conservative movement as it's known in America. So just to, to conclude where we are, let's go to France and emancipation, and then we'll wrap it up for the night. I'll heck, stick around for a few questions. Um, France was actually the first country to emancipate the Jews. They had enshrined in their 1789 revolution this wonderful statement, the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, uh, when a revolutionary named Marie Gouze said, wait a second, shouldn't we like phrase this in a universal that includes women? And they said, no, we're only talking about men. It's kind of a, the limits of the, uh, the revolution there. But the Jews said, hey, what about us? we should be included in this too, right? Liberté, égalité, fraternité, what's wrong with us? So the French at first said, well, you know, we're not quite prepared to do that. Um, there were two main types of Jewish communities living in France at the time. In the south, you had the Jews of Bordeaux and Bayonne, who were Sephardic, who were French-speaking, who were much more acculturated to French norms, dressed like Frenchmen, had a, a, a diverse economic profile and so on. But in the Northeast, you had this mass of Yiddish-speaking, ultra-Orthodox Jews who were more um, foreign to the French sensibility. So ultimately, the French said, okay, in 1790, they said, we'll give emancipation to the Sephardic Jews, and we're going to think about the Ashkenazim. But ultimately, they had to say, yeah, I guess we have to give it to the Ashkenazim as well. So in seven excuse me, in 1791, all the Jews of France were immediately emancipated. And as you might expect, all of these Alsatian Jews uh, were like incredibly well poised to certainly take advantage of their heightened levels of literacy and numeracy, and they started dominating the economy. So a lot of people complained to Napoleon a few years later, and Napoleon said, well, wow, we can't have this. Why don't we talk to the Jews themselves? What uh, do they have a, a body that we can address? And his advisor said, well, there was this great body called the Great Sanhedrin, but it has not met in 1800 years. Napoleon said, that's nonsense. Let's bring it together. And we're going to ask the Jews some questions. The, I love this picture here, which, which Napoleon is depicted as a kind of a Caesar-like figure. He's holding the tablets of the law. 
and he is raising up the fallen Judaism. And you can see in the background, the menorah, of course, and the, the Judean desert. He really had kind of like messianic images of himself. So they brought together this amazing organization, the Sanhedrin, which was largely populated by uh, people who were, you know, much less centrist, uh, attached to traditional Judaism, but they did have a president, uh, Rabbi David Sinsheim, who was actually a very well-respected rabbinic figure. He wrote a great commentary on the Mishnah called the Yad David. They gave him this remarkable hat, which I think we've got to bring back into fashion. Uh, and Napoleon said to the uh, Sanhedrin, it was actually called the Assembly of Jewish Notables at this point, I've got 12 questions for you. And these 12 questions were basically trying to figure out, did Jews consider themselves citizens of the state or foreigners? In other words, could we trust you if we went to war with Germany? Would you fight for France or would you join the enemy? What do you consider yourselves? And there are 12 of these questions, essentially asking the same thing, but in different ways. The Sanhedrin knew what he was asking, and they gave him exactly the answers he wanted. Like, for example, in the question of fighting for France, they, they all stood up and said, jusqu'à la mort, you know, we'll fight to Fran for France to the death. And so uh, Napoleon said, well, there you have it, everybody. The Jews are going to be patriotic. We will give them citizenship. And that's ultimately the recipe that has been followed by Jews in Western societies ever since. A lot more to say about that. For their part, the Jews were like slavishly grateful to Napoleon. Here's a medallion they, they struck in his honor, which shows his profile on the left. And on the right, amazingly, uh, Napoleon is depicted as a kind of God, giving the Ten Commandments to a bent and servile Moses. I mean, how could they actually think this was appropriate? But nevertheless, it certainly appealed to Napoleon that he had all these images of him being so gracious and magnanimous, and the Jews in return got their emancipation. So uh, we're going to have to leave the uh, on the eve of revolution till next week. It'll flow into our discussion of the 20th century. I'm really grateful for your incredible patience and tolerance of me just blathering on for a little over an hour. Uh, but at this point, I will take, I will stop and I will uh, invite you to uh, ask questions. Thank before you very we, much for your attention. Before we go to questions, I just want to say, Yeshakoach, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Um, I've never seen so much Jewish history told so well in such a short period of time. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple quick announcements, one of which is that uh, May 27th is the first Shabbat with a Difference and Shabbat with a Difference dinner uh, that we have of the season. Please, please sign up now. Bring your whole family. It will be wonderful. Secondly, um, the, 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 next, the next evening with Dr. Abramson is not next week. I apologize. That's the only thing I'll correct. Um, but actually, it's on the fortnight. So we'll see you for that in two weeks. And finally, um, we have a very unique situation going on right now where we are currently in the 25th day of the Omer, but our presenter is not. I can't tell you which day it is because then I would be counting the day, which I can't do, but he is actually in the 25th plus one. But that leads us to basically exactly the halfway point to Shavuot, and Shavuot is going to take place. Our evening program for Shavuot with Temple Shalom and Harel, um, learning about the food, uh, learning about Jewish food, their halachic and cultural backgrounds with, of course, samples will take place on, on June 4th, including cheesecake, kosher wine, gefilte fish, and challah. Um, so please join us for, uh, for that. And um, we have a question actually in the, in the chat box. And I, I prefer to just do questions either in the chat box or one of which was, we're going to go back in history to Spain. And the question was asked, did the Jews of Spain speak with you know? And can you explain the origin of the language and what happened to it after the Inquisition? Oh, excellent question. So <clears throat> the, the Jews of Spain actually spoke a... Uh, 
a series of languages which were all, you know, uh, related, but um, they tended to speak <laughs> the regional languages. So Castilian, for example, and uh, Provençal and whatever language, the regions in which they lived. Uh, Ladino essentially, and, and let's remember, we're talking now about the period of Shakespeare. So language in general is not really well defined and standardized uh, throughout Europe. So there are many, many Spanish dialects that are being spoken and Jews are across the board, but Castilian would definitely be the, the most significant dialect. Ladino is uh, ironically kind of a standardization of these dialects when Jews are in the diaspora, the Spanish diaspora, as they're you know, coming from different parts of the peninsula with very different dialects, they've got to kind of come together around one rough standard, and that became Ladino. Uh, you don't have the same phenomenon happening with Yiddish, where there are multiple dialects of Yiddish, but because the Jews simply stayed within their boundaries, there was no reason to kind of like find a, a central standard Yiddish. People call it Lithuanian Yiddish, but that's not necessarily because the Lithuanians were the dominant uh, group and the, the, the majority dialect. It's just that they were the first ones to actually sit down and start standardizing the spelling, the orthography and things like that. So Ladino essentially develops in the same way from the Spanish exiles in their diaspora. A very good question being asked, did the Spanish economy suffer once the Jews were expelled? Absolutely. It was incredibly difficult. Um, and, and in fact, the it's a very messy situation because the uh, the Jews were uh, debt holders and, uh, you know, they, the, um, the, the debts that they had to pay back to Spain were not easily acquired. Um, and the, uh, the debts that had to be paid to Jews in order to reimburse the throne for monies that they had advanced earlier. There are all kinds of messy situations involving the Jews, so much so, so that it, with especially wealthy landowners, uh, Jews, they had to um, you know, figure out things with them after they had been expelled. Uh, so it, it definitely caused the, the Spanish Empire to tank. Well, um, it is already 11.10 your time, so I think we will say toda uh, Thank you very sure. much. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that it is almost bedtime or beyond your bedtime, again, fabulous. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to, to learning with you on the fortnight. Thank you very much. It was great to speak with you all. Have an excellent thank night. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Night. Thank you very much. Thank you.